Hey there, everyone. It's me, Josh. And for this week's SYS Case Selects, I've chosen our episode on fainting goats from 2011. It's about the funniest, saddest breed of goats around, plus sad kittens, too. But it's also really cute in a weird way. At any rate, this one I will advise you to listen to accompanied by your laptop or phone uh, ready to go on YouTube because there's going to be a lot of stuff for you to check out. Enjoy it. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark. There's Charles W. Chuck Bryant. Me. Yeah, that's right. That's me. Now fall over. <laughs> Thud. Yes. Not yet, Chuck. We're getting there. Okay. Okay. Um, how are you doing? You feeling a little sick after Los Angeles? Yes, Josh. Uh, heavy workload and stress usually means Chuck uh, crashes and gets sick afterward. Yeah. I came very close. That's what happened As me. I was telling you, I am a walking <laughs> ad for emergency. I know. It works really well. It's good stuff. Um, Chuck, I hope you feel better soon. Thank you. Um, in the meantime, let's talk about the satanic symbol that is the goat. Yeah, the, the inverted star is supposed to be a goat head. Is that right? Yes. That is actually the uh, Baphomet. The Baphomet? The Baphomet. <laughs> uh, it's, a, I think, a 17th century French illustration. Um, no, 19th century French ma- magician uh, Eliphas Levi uh, drew the ba- Baphomet of Mendes, right? Okay. And Mendes is like the key term here. This is where the idea that the goat was satanic came from, okay? So back in the day, uh, back when the uh, Greeks were running around Egypt, let's say the 4th century BC, okay, um, one of them, Herodotus, uh, wrote of the Mendes people who lived along the Nile and venerated and essentially worshipped uh, goats, specifically male goats, as symbols of fertility. And the Greeks, doing what they did, eventually ripped this idea off and right. l- labeled their god Pan, the, k- the king of the satyrs, the uh-huh. half-god, half-man god. That's right. Who liked to woo the ladies and basically press his male goat sexuality onto them. <laughs> right? Okay. So Sounds we, like a... we have the idea that a male goat, uh-huh. a.k.a. a ram, in a lot of cases, I'm pretty sure, uh, became the symbol for powerful male sexuality, right? Sure, why not? As the Christian church came about and sexuality kind of diverged from um, reality, uh, that, that, I, that concept became more and more taboo, increasingly taboo, until finally you get to the point where um, we arrive at the Knights Templar, who supposedly um, venerated uh, Baphomet. Those the, guys pop up a lot with us. They do. Um, the, that, that image of Baphomet, not the 19th century one, but the image of a goat head, Mm -hmm. which they supposedly idolized, um, was used against them to persecute them as uh, Satanists and kill them. And from that point forward, the goat went from pagan god of male fertility or sexuality to satanic from that moment on, to the point now where you can look at a goat and you get a touch of evil from it, don't you? No. I was just about to counter and say that's funny because... Goats are the sweetest, most adorable little creatures on the planet. It depends. Me. First of all, it depends on their age. It depends on their size. It depends on how readily you can see those satanic eyes of theirs. <laughs> I disagree. It's Satan walking the earth, Chuck. <laughs> Let's just come out and say it, okay? I, well, we, know, we everyone knows I had pet goats, so you're not going to get me to say anything like that. Plus, if you're anything, you're a lackey for the goat lobby. I am. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what about fainting goats, though? I have to agree. These are not satanic. They are. They fall into the cute camp, right? Yeah, it's pretty cute and sad and funny. It's all wrapped up into one. Yeah. In fact, I have never experienced such a range of emotions as when <laughs> I watched fainting goats and fainting kittens. Yeah, fainting kittens in particular got my goat. I just showed Lizzie. It's awesome. She laughed. I know harder than I thought she would because it's hilarious, Chuck. <laughs> It's so sad looking, though. I know, but then they kind of look around and look like a stupid kitten and like oh. blink a few times and they're fine. I, I urge anyone who hasn't seen, first of all, Fainting Goats to go on to YouTube.com. That's Y-O-U-T-U-B-E.com. <laughs> yeah. It's a uh, kind of like a video repository of sorts. You can share videos. Type yeah. in, yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Um, you type in Fainting Goats 
and then watch the one with the uh, greatest number of hits, and you will see what we're talking about. I think it has 10 million... 800,000 hits right now. Yeah. Watch that one. You'll see what we're talking about the rest of the time. You can also, if you want to treat yourself, type in fainting goat kittens hyphen original video. And yeah. <laughs> you'll see what makes me laugh and makes Chuck cry. And if you want to really treat yourself, type in where's B. <laughs> oh, that one's adorable. That's the little the cu- lamb. Yeah, that's the cute. Is that a lamb or a goat? It's a lamb. Yeah, it, but a lamb cute. is a female goat, right? Or it's a baby goat? Isn't a goat a male lamb? A baby goat is a kid. A lamb is a lamb. Huh. Oh, yeah. A lamb is a baby sheep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We're all set. No need for emails, everybody. Myotonic goats. Okay. So, yeah, there's other names for these things. Now that hopefully you've gone and watched this, you're up to speed and you'll know what we're about to be talking about because we are going to explain this weird phenomenon that is feigning goats, a.k.a., as you just said, myotonic goats. What else, Chuck? What are some other awesome names for these things? The Tennessee Stiff Legs, which is a good name for a band, mm-hmm. as is myotonic goats. Tennessee Wooden Legs, uh, Nervous Goats, and Fall Down Goats. I imagine Fall Down Goats was pretty early in the game. Yeah, they that's, said, what, that's what eh. Bam Bam from Flintstone <laughs> called them. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, they go by several different names, Josh, but uh, they are not fading at all, actually. No, no. Uh, and we should say if you are too lazy to go look up this YouTube video and you don't know what we're talking about, basically um, these goats, the videos of goats who are being chased by like a farmer or something with an umbrella, and all of a sudden they'll just stiffen up and fall over, and it looks like they fainted dead away or possibly died and instantly gone yeah. into rigor mortis. It it's looks really... like they've been shot and killed yeah. by a sniper. <laughs> exactly. And then after a second, they just kind of get up and, and uh, you know run away some more. Um, and, uh, yeah, they're called feigning goats, but that's not at all what's going on. Instead, Chuck, it's like a, a, an altered startle response, right? Yeah, it's a congenital condition, means they get it since, you know, they're little baby kid goats. They were born with it. Right. And it's uh, called myotonia congenita. And uh, there's another couple of names, the Becker type disease or Thompson's disease. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they basically, we'll get into the specifics, but what happens is they tense up Mm -hmm. like the fight or flight, like if an explosion went off right behind you right now, you'd tense up and then go, whew. Maybe. What happens here is they tense up and they, they don't untense. They stay stiff long enough to fall over on their side as if they were dead. Yes, as um, appropriately Robert Lamb, who wrote this article, points out, <laughs> it's like that, you know, when you tense up from a, from a, a fright or a startle or danger, flight or fight, fight, fight or flight. Uh-huh. It's been a while, clearly. I know. Um, it, it, that tension that's relieved almost immediately, that basically your brain, like, getting your body, like, zapped into preparedness. Like, yeah, like, okay, get ready to run, Right. Goat. Stop, stop thinking about Tootsie Roll Pops, jerk. It's time for you to, to kick some bottom. Yeah. Or in the goat's case, quit thinking about that big patch of grass. Right. There's a wolf behind you. Right. Run and get out of here. Exactly. But instead of running, they tense up, they fall over, because their muscles take about 10 or 20 seconds to relax, right? Yes. So uh, you talked about um, myotonic. They're myotonic goats. Myotonia uh, exists in more than just um, goats. It yeah. exists uh, in humans as well. Yeah, kittens, we said. Yeah. Um, Saddest video ever. <laughs> it's so awesome. <laughs> and, and myotonia is basically this, uh, it's a nervous, it's a disorder of the central nervous system, a congenital one, like you said, Chuck, um, that's characterized by stiff muscles that they're, they're rigid and they take time to relax, right? Yeah, I, th- I think the, the stat- involuntary or voluntary muscles, we should say, not like your cardiac muscle or your right. involuntary muscle. Sure. Um, the stat I found was that it affects about one in one hundred thousand people, and in northern Scandinavia, one in ten thousand. Huh? Who knew? Well, I guess they um, they have a bottleneck up there of some sort. I don't know. Because not that many people want to move up to Scandinavia. I didn't see any kind of explanation for why there would be more abundant there, but that's how many it affects in people. If it's uh, if you have it, you, there's some medication. It's not that big of a deal. Stay exercise. Stay loose. Right. Uh, don't walk around big piles of glass, I would say, or beds of nails. <laughs> you don't want to fall on anything like that. Maybe you shouldn't be driving a car. But I don't think humans actually stiffen and fall over like the goats. I think it's more of a you know, a temporary stiffening. And Or again, as Robert Lamb put it, a full-body Charlie horse, but without the pain. Yeah. Yeah, they say they don't feel pain. I don't know about that. Yeah, we'll get into that in a second. All right. But uh, there's, a, there's a similar uh, condition, too, called um, myoclonus. And um, it, it's actually the basis of my favorite, probably my favorite um, physiological 
trait of humans. What's that? A myoclonic jerk. You know, when you're falling asleep and then all of a sudden you go, uh, and you, Is that you what that's jerk called? awake? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that happens to me. And if you'll notice, most of the time you're dozing and you're you're dreaming of maybe falling down a stair or sure. something like that. So apparently your brain is either confused mm-hmm. that you are in fact falling or it, do, it doesn't understand why your why your muscles are relaxing in some weird way right. and it's jolting you awake. Okay. Um or uh, it thinks you are dying and it's railing against dying. It's trying to get your heart going again. Well, Those are the two explanations I've heard. Either way, thank you, body. Yes. And mind. But another ner- another name for it is the hypnic jerk. The hypnic jerk. It's just great. Do you, you like it when it happens to you or you just yeah. think it's neat? It's so it's just funny. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that it's a weird feeling. It's sort of like when you <laughs> when you almost fall back in a chair and you catch yourself. There's nothing more like, you know, thrilling to the body than that that, oh my gosh, I'm going to die here in one second. Exactly. So you're, you're, it's thrilling because your muscles tense up. You mm-hmm. have to wonder if you're just sitting there for 10 or 20 seconds, does your brain, know, your brain apparently would know yeah. that there's no longer any danger, but you can't move. Right. Which I imagine would kind of be kind of stressful. We know that the brain knows that there's no longer any danger because the actual um, disorder is on the cellular level in the muscles, right? Yeah. uh, There's a gene, Josh, called the CLCN1, the chloride channel 1 gene. Of course. And uh, it's involved in the production uh, of proteins, which are, you know, proteins are good for muscle relaxing and contracting and stuff like that. Yeah, and chloride uh, ions specifically, right? Yeah. What's the deal? Too much chloride? Yeah, you well, you want remember check the point of being alive as a functioning body is homeostasis, right? Right. So you want um, an equal amount or a relatively comparable amount of positively charged sodium ions, which tell your muscles to contract. Right. And negatively charged chloride ions, which say go ahead and relax muscles, right? Oh, there's not enough chloride in this case. Yes. Right. So there's an abundance of sodium uh-huh. and not enough chloride, which means that when you when the cells are innervated, the muscle cells are innervated with an electrical uh, impulse from the brain, right. like tense up. Uh-huh. It takes them longer to relax because they're out of whack because this gene is not expressing those chloride ions like yeah. it should be. But Pretty cool. Th- so it's not the brain any longer thinking that we're afraid or that there's a danger. It's the muscles. It's all in the muscles. That's right. And it is hereditary. Uh, it can be dominant or recessive, meaning either one of your parents can have the gene or both. Not too picky there. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> the difference is with the goats is they're actually bred to encourage this. Right. And here you mentioned something a second ago um, that kind of smacked of – the ethics of it, right? I don't remember what it was. Maybe but I you're did. Kind of like, but eh. let's go. To, well, uh, just people laughing every time I see those videos. I think the goats, you know, they're all they're, they're roaming around their pen, and then I get the feeling they see people coming. And they're like, oh god, <laughs> here we go, <laughs> here we go again. Some jerk is going to shoot a gun in the air or something, and we're all going to fall over, and they're going to laugh at us. Very funny, ha ha. Right, exactly. So here we go again. Here we go again. And every time they see a human without fail, I'm sure a human does that to them. And the humans laugh and think it's the funniest thing they've ever seen. The goats are just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and actually there's two reasons that fainting goats are bred these days. Uh, One is for novelty because they do that. And another is for meat, basically. Yeah, that made me sad. I thought it would just be strictly novelty and having them as a pet. No, and initially, I mean, that's, that's what most livestock goats are used for is meat, and frankly, they're delicious. But um, I wouldn't know. They're so delicious. <laughs> goat is awesome. Goat. Um, but if you think of them as satanic, you can eat them all day long. It's like you're eradicating evil by eating the goat. <laughs> okay. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Give me one of those evil satanic goat tacos. <laughs> I, can, I want to I, do my part. Can I give you a, like a tad of history? Yeah. Do you want to talk about the history of it? 
Uh, sure. Okay. I know we're hopping around here. That's like right. Go on fire like, like B. But the um the reason that Tennessee stiff legs or fall down goats, as some people call them, <laughs> are called Tennessee stiff legs or Tennessee wooden legs, is because they were um, brought down from Nova Scotia, allegedly by a, a farmhand named John Tinsley. Yeah, that's what they think. Yeah. From what I saw, that was the likeliest explanation. Yeah, to Marshall County, Tennessee in the late 1800s, mm -hmm. 1880s. Yep, and he started breeding them, which uh, is, is called unnatural selection. We'll get to that in a second. Yeah. But um, this, these, the goats were originally not bred for novelty, right? It took 100 years for them to really start to be bred for novelty. They were bred because, Chuck, as you pointed out, their muscles don't atrophy. Right. They, they do the opposite, right? Well, yeah. I mean, if you think there's muscle waste going on, think again, because it actually makes the animal much leaner for slaughter. Right. Yeah, it's just hard for me to even say that. Right. So there's, because of all the tensing and untensing that they do yeah. more than the average animal, they're kind of bulk. They're ripped. Yeah, they're buff. Right? So they have a loaf. They're lean meat, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of meat to, um, to muscle as well. So they're prized for their meat, and apparently they're, they're – Propensity toward um, myotonism, Fainting, myotonia, tensing up, fainting, prevents them from keep from climbing fences, which is a big problem when you're uh, keeping goats as livestock. They like to just hop right over a fence you erect for them. Mine didn't. No, my goats loved being pet goats. I'm sure. Were they, they house they, goats? Well, no. We had a big pen, and they were actually in there with the dogs. We had two dogs and two goats, and they <laughs> were. I mean, the goats. I think took their cues from the dogs because they were very. Very playful, and uh, I used to play games with my goat, Nestor, all the time. Whatever happened? Uh, Nestor, well, Billy died, which is very sad. That's a good name for And me. then, of course. And then uh, Nestor, we eventually were like, you know what? We, we need to move Nestor out to a farm. So we, this lady took him. And Nestor rode what, in the back of the, the truck lady? with me with his head on my lap the whole way. And What did the lady do to Nestor, do you think? I think she kept Nestor as a goat, and okay. that's the story I'm sticking <laughs> to. That Nestor was a pet until he died of old age. That is a beautiful story, Chuck. Yeah. Um, okay, so good. So your, your goats fared very well. I'm mm -hmm. glad to hear that. I remember the goats at my birthday party? They, they, one of them was a house goat, remember? Oh, yeah. House goat. Uh-huh. Wow. Um, so there was an actual reason that feigning goats were bred initially, and it wasn't for kicks. The Tennessee farmers of the 1880s actually were a little more soulful than the ones today. Yeah, and it wasn't funny back then. Nothing was funny back then. I'm sure somebody, then. right, right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Don't laugh at that. <laughs> I can't say it. I just had like 80 <laughs> great jokes ran through my head. So are you talking about the protection of the herd? Not yet. Oh, okay. So uh, the, the goats become an established breed of their own by the 1950s. Right. And about that time, they start to leave Tennessee. I think for Texas was the next place that they really spread out. Uh -huh. But it wasn't until the 1980s that uh, the, the goats were really diverged into two, not necessarily two dif different breeds because they haven't separated yet, but there's one line that's generally bred for meat Right, uh, okay. like the original version. Gotcha. And the other line is bred as a novelty, okay. and they tend to be smaller and just faint like that. Cuter. Yes. Faint longer. Yeah, because if you just kind of leave it alone, uh -huh. um, the the uh, myotonia is worse as uh, a, a younger, worse early in life. Yeah, they get kind of used to it. Sometimes more, uh, they adapt to it. They're not as scared later in life. So, yeah, a right. younger goat is more prone to fall over stiff. Exactly. So, but I think if you compare an adult um, fainting goat bred mm -hmm. in that line to be a novelty to a, uh, a goat that was bred for its meat of the same age, the, the novelty goat's going to probably fall over at the drop of a hat <laughs> right, still. Right, 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 right. Because farmer thinks that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other uh, reason that, that Robert says they can't find much evidence of this anymore, but I guess back in the day, they would, and this sort of makes sense. They would, they would uh, add some of these fainting goats to their herd of regular goats mm -hmm. in case there were predators around. A pack of wolves come up, scares the the little pebbly doo doo out of these goats, <laughs> and then the stiff goats fall over and get eaten while the other ones take off and run. So it essentially, it's almost like they're not bait, but uh, you know, a much easier kill. Keep the wolves occupied so the rest of them can escape. You know what they are? What? A sacrificial lamb. <laughs> yeah, you're right. 
is exactly what they are. But th- there's no evidence that that's really the reason that they're breeding them now. No, and, and there's apparently not much evidence that – or how, how much that was used. I think it could have just been a good idea, right? Yeah. So Chuck, the idea of uh, like make no 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 mistake, myotonia is a um, it's a deficiency, it's yeah. a disorder. Sure, it's not a desirable trait. No. So the idea of taking a, a because it's an undesirable trait under natural selection, it shouldn't exist, right? Right. Because if you take a feigning goat out in nature, like you said, they won't last along long. with a herd of sheep or other goats or whatever. Yeah. Uh, no, they'll they'll be the first eaten, and then they won't have a chance to reproduce eventually, and it'll that trade would die out. But them being um, bred for that for an undesirable trait, and then protected by humans, whether by a fence or right. uh, you know like a hillbilly with a, hillbilly with a shotgun or whatever, <laughs> yeah, that's called unnatural selection, right? Oh, yeah, nothing natural about it. No, or artificial selection is another way to put it. Yeah, and the, anytime something like that happens, there's going to be. Some people probably at an organization called PETA <laughs> that might stand up and say, I don't know if this is such a cool thing for humans to do. And PETA, as expected, uh, isn't the biggest fan of raising feigning goats. Uh, Humane Society isn't so worried about it. Um, they say there's a lot uh, more breeding issues in the world that we should be more concerned about. Mm-hmm. And neither one of them have an official stance. But No, the woman from PETA that Robert interviewed in this article sounded like she hadn't heard of feigning goats until he called her. Oh, really? Yeah, that's the impression I got. Oh, yeah, the quote is a little vague, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, she just like, the standard PETA quote, just plug in the animal. <laughs> <laughs> but who knows? Uh, there is no official stance, though. So maybe maybe Robert alerted her to this whole phenomenon. Yeah, I'll bet they have an official stance now. Yeah, probably. And it's stop breeding feigning goats. It's a little late for that, though. It's a recognized and um, prized as a separate American breed of goat. There's about 3,000 to 5,000 of them running around and then falling over. Right. Um, and they don't look like they're going anywhere. Um, the uh, livestock... Conservancy, I think, is what it's called, um, suggests that this uh, this breed of goat be uh, very much um, protected and taken care of and yeah. conserved is, I guess, the best word to use. Did I tell you about Emily and the little baby goat at the winery? No. At the winery in Athens? No. We went to, uh, right before this L.A. trip, you know, we went up oh, to yeah. Santa Barbara, yeah. wine country. Yeah. And we went in this one uh, winery, and uh, as we were going in, there was a guy with a dog outside. And, you know, of course, we attacked this dog and were petting it. He said, yeah, they wouldn't let it in because they got a goat, a baby goat in there. So Emily hears this, of course, and it's just like in this inside saying, where's the goat? Where's the goat? This lady has a probably about a six-week-old kid in her arms, wrapped in a blanket mm-hmm. that um, has some sort of physical ailment, not feigning uh, goat syndrome. It was part human? Part human. It had human hands. <laughs> um, no, but she had this little baby kid, and uh, you know, Emily goes over and starts drooling, and the lady says, do you want to hold it? And in less than a second, the, the goat swap had been made, and you know, for the next 20 minutes, this goat is literally like nuzzling Emily in the neck. Nice. And I took about 20 pictures of the, the range of emotions on uh, Emily's face. It's yeah, was funny. there any crying at all? There wasn't crying. It was just, it was a type of ecstasy that you rarely see in an adult human That's female. Awesome. That <laughs> is pretty awesome. cool. Yeah, very cute. You're like, long story short, we own that goat now. Yes. Yeah. No, not true. My aunt used to have a pygmy goat in California along the Russian River. Did they not get big, I guess? No. Hence the... I would say a pygmy feigning goat would be about the cutest combination. <laughs> yeah. Especially one that, like, uh, asked to shine your shoes with, like, big doe eyes or something, you know? <laughs> Those kittens, though, man. I can't watch that. Yeah. It looks – it just doesn't look right. It's awesome, I think. <laughs> because they don't look like they're hurt. They don't look injured. They just look surprised every time and then fine. Well, kittens look surprised with everything. They just – they have that constant look of surprise. Yeah. Anything else? No. We've touched on – the satanic nature of goats, mm-hmm. meat goats, fainting goats, fainting kittens, unnatural selection, Tennessee, uh, Texas, the 19th century. <laughs> 
And that's about it, right? Emily's unnatural love of animals. Yeah. Myoclonic jerks. Yeah. Everything's right on. Uh, and now, you know, when you see these videos and you show your buddies, you can now tell people this is something this you is should exactly know. exactly what's going on. Say they're not fainting at all, actually. Yeah. Stupid. <laughs> So, if you want to learn more about fainting goats, remember, go to YouTube, Y-O-U-T-U-B-E dot com, and type in um, fainting goats, and then fainting goat kittens. This doesn't really make sense. It could just be fainting kittens, but still. Yeah. Um, and you'll see some hilarity. You can also learn more about fainting goats in a very well-written and well-researched article by Robert Lamb of Stuff to Blow Your Mind, How Fainting Goats Work. Type that into the handy search bar at HowStuffWorks.com and that will bring that up and that means I just brought up listener mail that's right Josh uh, I'm going to call this a real CSI dude uh, this is from Ed in Chico, California hey Josh and Chuck and Jerry I'm a crime scene investigator for a municipal police department in rural northern California being a CSI is just one of my collateral assignments I'm also an evidence technician and have a couple of other titles depending on who's giving me orders that day Nearly every agency in my area has trained cops or civilians uh, to be a CSI when needed, not as a standalone assignment. So that kind of answers one of the questions we had. Yep. Uh, I showed interest in being a CSI when I started my evidence assignment four years ago and was sent to basic CSI school. Then later, advanced CSI, uh, crime scene reconstruction school. He skipped right over intermediate. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. This guy's gifted. And finally, uh, blood spatter analysis. Uh, we also do monthly in-house training on topics like photography, trajectories, DNA collection, uh, buried body excavation, etc. Our CSIs are jacks of all trades since our agencies are too small to be able to afford specialized positions. Uh, your show was very well researched and had all the highlights of blood spatter and forensic photography. Uh, and as a sidebar, while we do have two big expensive uh, $2,000 SLR cameras, we really only use them for the most specialized photos like nighttime crime scenes uh, 99% of the time they use a point and shoot from Walmart Not really? Enough. yeah I could see that though I mean like that, that technology's gotten good enough so that I'm sure I know but it would just seem weird if you saw Dexter like walk up with a little point and shoot <laughs> yeah and plus I, I think if you were the family of like a murder victim and you saw some guy walk up with a point and shoot you'd be like are you even supposed to be here? yeah how about a real camera? yeah how about a little respect? you mentioned blood voids at a crime scene we call them blood shadows. Oh, I like that one, too. That's Pretty cool. Ghoulish. Uh, I enjoy being a CSI, but like Josh said ages ago, uh, television ain't nothing like reality. I can't stand watching those shows. They drive me crazy, but they're not based in reality writing. In reality, DNA evidence takes one to two months, and latent prints can take four or five months, not four to six minutes. Yeah, and the other thing is, is like uh, everybody is just this jack of all trades. Like, oh, I, I, I got these prints off of this scene, and I'm going to go analyze them, and I'm going to go, like, shake down the bad guys. Right. You know? It's Just, like, spend more money on yeah. an ensemble, will you? <laughs> Thank you, Ed from Chico. Oh, that was it? Yeah, that was it. Sorry to end your letter with a rant from me, Ed. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, your illuminating letter. We appreciate it. Um, we want to hear from you. First of all, you can go um, check us out on Facebook, facebook.com slash stuff you should know. You can follow us on Twitter, uh, SYSK Podcast. And you can join our Kiva team, kiva.org slash team slash stuff you should know. You can also always email us. And specifically, if you have ever tampered with uh, natural selection through artificial selection, we want to hear about it. Send us an email about this. Right, Chuck? That's right. That's uh, stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit howstuffworks.com. Want more How Stuff Works? Check out our blogs on the howstuffworks.com homepage. <laughs>